Hello, kidney warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dadvice TV Live, where you get to learn all about kidney disease, things that you can do to be more proactive in your, your care, and all sorts of other positive, helpful, and science-backed information. Now, when I was first diagnosed with kidney disease, it was scary. It was frightening. And part of that was because I didn't know much about kidney disease. And when I went online to try to learn about it, I saw lots of scams and I knew there were scams right away because I knew you can't cure it and there is no magic pill to fix it. But the majority of the information talked about dialysis, life on dialysis. And I decided right then and there, my goal with kidney disease was to do everything I can to learn about it, to make the changes I needed to make to hopefully avoid dialysis forever or at least as long as possible. And that is what we are gonna talk about tonight. Ways that you can, things you can do to help manage kidney disease and hopefully avoid or at least delay needing dialysis, especially for older adults. Now to talk about this, we got us an expert, the author of my favorite book about kidney disease. And this is a book that for everyone out there that's diagnosed with kidney disease, I wish a doctor would hand you this book and say, hey, you've got kidney disease. Don't go on the internet, it's gonna be scary, but read this book first, write down some questions and come back and talk to me. That book, of course, is Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease by Dr. Rosansky. And you can get a copy of this book from Amazon. I got a link right there, go.dadvicetv.com slash book to go straight to Amazon where you can get this book. You could also call up your local mom and pop bookstore. They sure would love you to visit them and order the book instead of going through the, the big giant Amazon. But no matter how you get it, I highly recommend getting a copy of that book. Now let's go ahead. Let's jump right on in to talking about how you can manage your kidney disease, be more proactive, in your care and hopefully avoid the need for dialysis, especially for older adults. Please welcome my co-host tonight back from about a month and a half break that I took to relocate my family from Cincinnati up to Michigan. Please welcome Dr. Rosansky. Hey, Doc. Hey, James. James, I missed you, James. And I miss <laughs> your audience and I miss the show. I really enjoy it. Uh, and I, I, I feel very gratified that I had the opportunity to write the book that you just mentioned and to talk about kidneys to patients. And this has been a lot of fun. And I certainly hope that I have alleviated some anxiety in many of your viewers and offered some very helpful information for others as well. Do you want me to introduce myself and give yeah, my Yeah, yeah, because I'm sure we got a lot of new people. And look at this, Beverly said best book ever. I agree with you, Beverly. Anyone who has kidney disease, this book helps you get rid of a lot of that worry and fear that you have by answering questions and telling you what to focus on. But go ahead and give a quick introduction about yourself for our new viewers. Sure, sure, sure. So I am a retired kidney specialist. I still see patients. I saw them today in the free clinic. I see kidney patients there. Um, I took care of kidney patients over 40 years. I started a kidney program here in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I've also done a lot of uh, research on kidney issues, and I've been recognized for my contribution in the area of progression of kidney disease, as well as the issue of when to start dialysis, which we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to talk about a subject that I'm very passionate about. And it's interesting, James, when I wrote my book, um, actually, when I, when I started doing the research about when to start dialysis and had a paper that was voted the number one game changer in nephrology in 2011, Ooh. pretty serious stuff. This is not just some joke. My colleagues thought this book, this research was very, very important. Um, and, and back in those days, I was really upset by older folks being put on dialysis way, way early and unnecessarily. And guess what, James? 
I am one of those older folk now at 75. <laughs> so, so I'm talking about myself, too. I, I, I'm getting close. I'm, I'm not going to catch up with you, but I'm getting close. <laughs> so um, let's just start out with some general issues, again, to try to alleviate anxiety, because you may have a lot of new, newly diagnosed kidney uh, CKD, that scary chronic kidney disease, that scary term. And for those of you who just got the diagnosis or had the diagnosis, understand, and we've said this many times, it is very, 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 very rare, like one in a thousand maybe of the folks who have so-called CKD that will wind up needing dialysis or a kidney transplant, okay? Um, and the risk is, um, uh, is very low, especially for you older adults, if you're managed right. One of the problems with young and old is that us kidney doctors with good intentions, you know, as you know, James, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions. Oh, yeah. As my colleague told me many years ago, colleague named Bill from Canada, um, you know, the, the kidney docs decided that they were going to try to get everybody to know your kidney number. And, um, and that was especially problematic for older adults because they have theoretically an abnormal kidney number and way, way too many people are being diagnosed with kidney disease that don't really have any serious kidney issue. And especially this is the case for you older folks. <clears throat> And more importantly, or as important, way too many older folks are winding up on dialysis early when they have lots of kidney function left and unnecessarily. And we're gonna break it down as to where, how we got here. One of the big issues, and James is a big proponent of trying to educate you and I'm helping James as well as I can. Part of the problem is understanding what your kidney number is, your E, G, F, R. Your E for estimated, and I repeat, estimated. It's not the actual, it's just an estimated mm -hmm. GFR. And GFR is glomerular filtration rate. It just means how the kidneys function. Don't worry about it. You read my book and you'll get into what the glomeruli are. Now, now quick <laughs> question, a couple questions yeah. here, Doc. Yeah. So that people who are new, I'm going to try to hopefully help clarify some stuff. Sure. So the sure. EGFR is an estimate, and that's the most important part of that, the, the E, the estimate of my kidney function. How do they calculate that estimate at a high level? What what do they look for? You're going to get your answer in just a minute. I know okay. you're, you're right and on I, the I money. I want to make sure you explain that you're that thing the they look for is not bad. That 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 question is very important for older folks, and we're going to get to that in, in a couple minutes. It depends, number one, on a blood test called creatinine. And, uh, and so now we'll, let's talk about what, what, what does it mean when your doc says you have an abnormal EGFR, okay? Um, remember their estimates. And the way to get the actual uh, measure, as James knows, is collecting 24-hour urine, which is very hard, very expensive. There's other ways to get the actual GFR, but they're not really being used. And I'm, I'm okay with getting estimated GFR as long as you, your doctor, and the people doing this test understand what that test means, okay? And if you get multiple estimated GFRs, that has value because you can look at the trend of your kidney function. So the first thing is I mentioned creatinine. That's what the main determinant of the eGFR is. What is creatinine? As opposed to what you'll see on all kinds of videos, all kinds of YouTube videos, about lowering your creatinine and diets and all this other nonsense. Creatinine is not the boogeyman. The creatinine is just coming from your muscle. And when you function and your muscles function every day, you have breakdown of a product in muscle called creatinine. It's normal, has nothing to do with a poison. You don't have to try to get rid of it. It's nonsense, okay? And guess what? And James knows this your creatinine will relate to the amount of muscle in your body. And this gets to James question. What is this EGFR? How do they magically calculate it? <clears throat> well, 
the docs decided, kidney docs got together and said, hey, you know, as we age, we lose muscle. And all of you, and I will always say this whenever I get a chance, try to exercise. Preserving your muscle is the best way to preserve your life and your brain, okay? Exercise. So you're gonna lose muscle as you age. Because you lose muscle, you have to put a fudge factor in the equation, the estimate for your age. There you go, James, right? It's yep. just a fudge factor for your age. <clears throat> so now let's dig into a little bit more about this estimated GFR and some of the problems that come up with, with older patients. Um, the normal creatinine is one, okay? The one. And if your creatinine value on a lab test is 1.1 or 1.2, that could have a massive effect on your eGFR. You may go to the, and the labs are not that exact. I mean, one lab and another lab, they'll, they'll get different values, different days of the week, different months, different they, years for the same real value. I've got different values from two labs on the same day, just a few hours apart. Uh, uh, you know, like a six or seven point difference when yeah. my, when, when I was very low and that was a huge percentage. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. If the normal is one, if you went from one to 1 1.2, you can get a massive change in your EF, EGFR, which will be around 60 plus. So those of you who got a number of EGFR 60 plus and you don't have protein in your urine, Hello, you do not have kidney disease, but, but you can still pay attention, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you'll learn something more, okay? It's, and, and it took a long time for the kidney docs and the labs to go, hey, you know, there's a lot of confusion about numbers above 60. Maybe we should just say if it's over 60, we're not even going to give you the number. But it's not worth reporting because it has no value. And so for those of you, who are looking at going from 80 to 70 or look at this magical stuff like, you know, keto analogs that, that some people push and write books about and other dietary things that you'll get your EGFR from 80 to 70 or 80 to 60. Hello, it's meaningless. Those numbers are not real numbers. Okay. That's the first thing. So uh, not every lab is, is, is gotten hip to this thing and reports it the way I just said, which, hopefully all labs will eventually agree over 60. It's not an accurate value. I would actually yeah. love to see ranges instead yeah. of numbers for everything. Uh -huh. yeah. Cause for me, uh, a, a 33 and a 36 are the same. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And here's one way to look at it. No matter where you are on your EGFR. And again, I just saw patients today and I see this every day. Their numbers are all over the map in one year. I've got a patient whose values were 2.4 and they were up to 3.8, down to 2.6, you know, and without any rhyme or reason to it, you need to know the trend over months or years. Okay, that's really critical. So let's get back to age and your kidney number, all right? Let's take a, let's take a male, a white male with a creatinine, okay, that's your lab test. If you go to your lab value to see your serum creatinine again, Again, that's how the lab determines your estimated GFR. If you're 1.5 and you're uh, 50 years old, that'll give you a 56 eGFR. The same creatinine of 1.5, if you're 80, your number is only 47. So this gives you an idea of how age, the fudge factor is gonna give you lower numbers, which is part of the problem because older folks are gonna have lower numbers and they're going to be treated as if they have a kidney problem when they really don't have it. So, um, and, and that, that 80 year old with a 47, that might be normal for him. And I'm going to tell you why. First of all, you lose about 10 units, uh, of EGFR. You lose about one unit per year after yeah. age 40. Okay. Lose about 10 units per decade. And here's a way to correct for it. There's lots of different things. Some labs and hopefully all labs will eventually say, this is the age related normals or range that you should be for your age. Some labs are doing it. A lot aren't doing it yet. Oh, that would One be way, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. One way to correct your, for your age, 
is add half your age to your EGFR. Isn't that fun? Okay. You with me so far? Yep. Let's take the same 80 year old, right? With a creatinine of 1.5. He had an EGFR of 47. Well, his, his age is 80. Half of 80 is 40. What does that give you? 87. <laughs> 40 plus 47, 87, okay? And some labs are doing that. They're, they're saying, here's the age-related uh, range. And uh, a country that, by the way, and I have colleagues in this country, Australia, New Zealand. I don't know if anybody's watching from Australia, New Zealand. But let me tell you, if you are in Australia and New Zealand, my opinion, you're much luckier than being in the United States or a lot of Europe where they're putting you on dialysis way too early, in my opinion. And I've done and reported on this in the, in the Kidney International, that people in the UK and Australia, New Zealand, on the whole, are getting on dialysis at lower kidney numbers, which the evidence and the research points to that's the right thing to do. <clears throat> in Australia and New Zealand, here's what they say. If you're over 70, and your EGFR is over 45, and you don't have a lot of, or you don't have significant protein, and we'll get to that, in the urine, okay? You don't have kidney disease. You have your age-related decline. Mm -hmm. I mean, Australia and New Zealand is ahead of the game. I don't know that we're gonna see that in the US or some countries in Europe or even in, in Canada. Uh, <clears throat> And James knows this very well. One of the main reasons why we doctors, we kidney doctors said, hey, we need to let people know their kidney number is because a lower kidney number is what? What does it predict, James? Besides kidney failure, which is unusual, but it predicts this, which is much more common. What is that common thing? Are you talking about heart disease? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your risk of getting heart disease is much higher. Blood vessel disease, brain, strokes, decreased blood supply to their different parts of your body, the various heart failure, heart attacks. That risk goes up as your kidney number goes down, and especially <clears throat> as your protein in the urine goes up. Um, and the commonest cause of death for people who have so-called CKD is not kidney failure by any stretch. It's don't make me say it. Of the arteries, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, hardening of the arteries. <clears throat> and this is especially the case for older folks. Um, uh, you're far more likely all of you to die of a heart cardiovascular problem than a kidney problem. And even if you are older and you have stage four, it's still, you're still much more likely to not need dialysis, to, to die of natural causes related to your blood vessels, your heart, and then, then, then likely uh, needing dialysis, okay? And this is because most of you older folks will have little protein in the urine, maybe urinalysis trace or one plus of urine protein in the urine. And it's been shown, the research shows that if you are, you know, over 70, 75 like me, and you got an EGFR over 45, you are not at a higher risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, okay? Um, the risk of, of dying from a heart attack or a stroke goes up as your GFR goes down and as your urine protein goes up. The two combined are what really matters. And we kidney docs finally have wised up to stop talking about just these stages with EGFR. We combine EGFR and urine protein when we talk about kidney stages, which makes a lot more sense because that urine protein is really a much more important factor for most of you. <clears throat> Why else should you even get your kidney number because you want to know if you're at risk of progressing, right? And as I said, it's rare that you are going to progress to dialysis or transplant. The big predictor of that, as we've talked many times, James, is your urine what? 
Oops, hold on one second. I was protein. answering a question. You're in protein. Yes, you're yes. In you're protein. you're in protein, protein. and you're it's protein. so misunderstood, especially with foam. When people have foamy urine, they think it's it's kidney disease, um, <laughs> or the yeah. You won't believe how many people have sent me pictures of foamy urine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is this kidney disease? Listen, listen, there's there's ways to measure protein in the urine without 24 hour collections. You just get a sample of urine and your doctor should know how to get the ratio of the protein to creatinine in your urine. I won't get into that tonight, but also urine dipstick protein, you know, trace, not really important. One plus, probably not important. As you get up to two plus or more, you got a problem. That's just ballpark. We're not going to get into urine protein tonight. But most of you older folks, <clears throat> whether you're stage three, which is the number 30 to 60, right, on EGFR, or stage four, which is 15 to 30, you're most likely going to have non-proteinuric. In other words, you don't have urinalysis with two plus or more protein consistently. Old, younger folks are more likely to have that protein in the urine and they're more likely to have a more rapid loss of their kidney function. As a matter of fact, if you're 75, 80, 85, 90, and you're stage three, and you don't have protein in the urine, one study showed a large percentage, 25, 30% of you stable for 10 years mm -hmm. if you don't have protein in the urine. Don't panic because you have an EGFR that is supposedly abnormal. Now we have some people asking, yeah. how do you reduce protein in the urine? Uh, we are not going to talk about that tonight because that is a several talks. But um, but I will tell you that if you have a lot of protein in the urine, you need to be in, at a minimum on an ACE or an ARB. These are blood pressure medicines that have been shown to lower urine protein. And then there's other newer medicines that may lower urine protein. That'll be for another night. Now let's talk about if you're older and you've got an abnormal kidney number, what if you're diabetic? This is a very important issue. If you have an abnormal kidney number, you're an older patient, should you be shooting for that A1C of seven or less? No, no. too low. Why, why, why James? It, it's too low. Data shows there is no benefit. There's going to a lot of effort and no benefit. It's not just no benefit. If you are an older person with kidney disease and you try to get your A1C to a seven range, you're risking your death and you're risking hospitalization. It's not just no benefit. It's potentially harmful. And this Controlling sugar and diabetes is a multi-decade problem. If you're a younger person, by all means, shoot for that tight control. What about your blood pressure? <clears throat> if you're an older person with CKD, what do you want to do about your goal blood pressure? And again, this is ballpark. Around 120 we, over, was it 80 still? Okay, so here's the deal, James. The 120 is as a, the most recommendations from heart doctors, kidney doctors, all people, including the kidney, international kidney organizations say, yeah, 120, there's a study that called was called sprint came out and showed you can live longer in terms of decreasing your risk of heart attacks and strokes and stuff. If you shoot for 120, but it gets a little dicey as you get older. And if you've got kidney disease, what's the dicey part? of this if you have kidney disease, remember? If you lower your blood pressure from 110 to 120, what can your kidneys say to you without uh, talking really, but they're telling you to not to do what? If you lower too much- I do not know the answer, <laughs> but too, too low your, is bad, just like too oh, high. If you lower too much, you can, in some cases, make your kidney function worse. So here's my thing. I'd say if you're an older folk, 130 is a reasonable goal. I would not shoot for the 120. Also, older folks, if you lower too much, you can wind up falling or passing out. 
If you're a young person, especially you got protein in the urine, by all means, go for that 120 or less because that aggressive uh, approach may slow your decline as long as you're being followed by, by, your, by, your, by your GP or your, or your kidney doc. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so let's get right into the dialysis question. How do we avoid dialysis? Too many older folks are starting dialysis with stage four, James. Oh my stage four. Oh. So many. Mind boggling. Stage four is over 15, 15 to 30. They can have decades ahead of them before they need dialysis. And and look, and you just said it. I'm 75. I don't have decades. I mean, unlike, but might, but it's unlikely. But anyway, as you get older, you have limited life expectancy. And so no rush to go on dialysis, right? Unless you really need it. One of the problems is most folks don't get to make the decision. Their doctor said, well, you got, you got kidney trouble and you need to go on dialysis. Don't fall for that. Don't let your doctor tell you that. Get my book, go over the, the stories about when to start dialysis and people that started dialysis unnecessarily early. Read that, go to your doctor with that and see what he or she has to say. Okay, quick question for you, doc. Yeah. I, I was thinking I probably should ask this one and someone asked it. Can you define what older folks are? Yeah, well, look. You know, it used to be it used to be ten years older than whoever you are, uh, and uh, you know when I was sixty five, it was seventy five. Now that I'm seventy five, it's eighty five. But look, I would say seventy five is a good reasonable point, okay? Um, and uh, and some people would say even seventy or sixty five. But look, some of us are lucky, and at seventy five, knock on wood, I, I, I have not had heart attack, strokes, or diabetes, or in blood pressure issues. I've been very lucky and I exercise and I try to eat right and all that other good stuff. You could be 50 and, and have a body that, uh, you know, would not match a healthy 80 year old. So a lot of it just has to do not just with your chronological age, but your, your physical age, how you're doing physically. Um, another thing I want to bring up, James, this is really supports what I'm telling you for older folks that, it turns out that as you get older, you go to 75, 85, unless something happens to you, which we'll talk about called acute kidney injury or something gets your kidneys to really crap out, like your blood pressure drops down too low or you get dehydrated or you're on medicines that drop your, uh, your kidney function. Um, most of you will have a slower decline of your kidney function with age, no rush. Okay. What about complications? Most people think I've got a kidney number 50 or 60. I'm going to feel sick. That's not the case. When do you start maybe having complications of your kidney number? Less than 30 stage four, less than 30. All right. And for me, they didn't show up until for about three weeks. I got, I had symptoms. And at that point, I was probably 10 or lower. I had nothing that I noticed up until then because they were so mild if there was any symptoms. And don't listen to this woo-woo on the internet. You got to take this for your kidney health and you're going to feel better because all the symptoms, all the normal aches and pains and, and things that we all experience you know, every day, you're going to feel better. People attribute it to their kidney number. No. Don't even think that it's going to be due to your kidneys until you're below 30, maybe. And then you've got things. If you're an older person, this is really the key point, James. There's lots of medical treatments aside from dialysis that can keep you feeling fine without a kidney machine when you're in that, you know, stage four and even stage five, less than 15. We've got the EPO shots to give you, get your hemoglobin up, treat your anemia. We got stuff to keep your potassium under control. And, and if you use the water uh, pills right, we can keep your fluids under control. This so-called conservative non-dialysis management 
is probably the best thing for the vast majority of you older folks that have kidney numbers in the stage four or five range. In other words, you know, less than 15 or even, you know, 15 to 30. And um, if you happen to be one of the patients that has had heart attacks, that has had strokes, that's unable to walk, and this may not be you, it may be your mom and dad or somebody you know, you will likely live longer with conservative therapy than getting on dialysis. Dialysis, even when you get down to lower numbers like five to 10, is going to benefit those people that have a reasonable life expectancy. And I, there's, there's a chapter in my book, a lot of people say, hey, how long am I expected to live? I'm 80 years old, I, I, I'm gonna go on dialysis. You know, what, what's my life expectancy on dialysis? There's actually stuff in my book that you can discuss with your doctor that'll give you an idea. If you happen to be one of these people that has a lot of bad stuff that's already happened to you, you've had strokes, you've had heart attacks, you can't walk, it's unlikely that even if you wait till your number gets down you know, to like five or so, that dialysis will, 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 will add to your life expectancy. <clears throat> what I suggest, if you don't have an emergency, is ask your doctor if you can try what I talked about, conservative management. If you get down to these low levels of kidney function before agreeing to dialysis, and don't let your doctor tell you to do it. You need to decide with your doctor. Can we try non-dialysis therapy? Try to treat my fluids, my low blood count. You know, try to treat it without the machine. <clears throat> and and if you ask doctors, I'm sorry, I'm starting to get blurry here. I don't know. Yeah, you're getting blurry, but we can hear you fine. It'll <laughs> I, come back. I, it's just the internet. <laughs> If, if, you, uh, if you ask kidney doctors, what should be the main reason that we consider putting someone on dialysis? It's symptoms, right? But when you actually go and look at why kidney docs started their patients on dialysis, not so much. <laughs> yeah. And Most actually, of you know, reason, kind of to build on top of this, um, someone who we, we had a kidney warrior here. Um, who sadly just passed last month, but he and his wife, he was 92, watched the programs. He had learned from you and he didn't want to go on dialysis because he knew it would just be a, a very poor quality of life for him and it wouldn't add anything to his life. His wife worked with him. GFR was four and five whenever he got tested. He was he got his energy back. He started walking and he had three and a half years with yeah. her before he finally passed. Um, and he, he got to make memories with his grandchildren. I don't want to cry. <laughs> Gets James, me all sad but, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, Which but was, he did that and it was yeah. in New Zealand. Um, and they were very thankful for the extra time with him and he wasn't suffering. He actually, was doing things. They took trips. They went on a little cruise. They did all sorts of things that if he was on dialysis, he would not have been able to do. And they just used medication with the doctor to manage the symptoms. And he wasn't suffering, which was fantastic. Well, you when you go on dialysis, you <clears throat> will likely spend a lot of time in the hospital you got to get these access surgeries and they often don't work. Dialysis should be the last resort, especially for older folks. And, um, <clears throat> you know, most of the people that are getting put on dialysis, especially older folks are not, are not being put on for good reason when they're, and, you know, maybe when you get down to around five or five to 10, maybe start thinking about it. But for most of you, you probably, my research showed, that the people who live the longest started dialysis lower than five. Okay, not over 15, but lower than five. <clears throat> and in one nursing home study, James, they looked at the reason why people were put on dialysis and they found that almost 20% started over, fifth, over 15. Crazy. And most of the people had no real indication. 
Don't let that happen to yourself or anybody you know. <clears throat> Another research study by a colleague of mine showed in the U.S. vast majority of folks that are over 75 being started EGFRs over 12 way too early in my opinion. There are absolute reasons to start. If you can't control your potassium, you can't control your fluids, especially if you're not making urine, you have severe vomiting, no other reason for it. Uh, that's some rare situations where you may need to really consider start analysis. Um, and if, again, if your doctor is talking to you about start analysis, especially if you've got a lot of, you've had heart disease, you've had other problems, you know, uh, you're probably not going to live longer if you go on dialysis. And I advise all of you, young or old, to have an advanced directive. Because if your advanced directive means what happens if my heart stops or should I have a tube put in my, my throat? <clears throat> Many older folks wind up in an ICU with a tube in their throat on a kidney machine. You want to make sure you tell people in your family whether that's what you want. Yeah, we have a video here about that uh, talking. I think it was with Lana Light talking about those decisions and why it's important. Now, we have a question related to what you just said, uh, Doc. John asked, if you have stage five cancer, should you consider going on dialysis? It's a tough question. Um, <clears throat> here's, listen, I think it, it depends on where you're at with your kidney function. So <clears throat> if you are a younger person and you're losing your kidney function, and you want to get ready for a kidney transplant because your kidney function is going to get close to zero, I have no problem starting on dialysis, maybe a little bit early even. If you've got a lot of comorbidities, whether you're young or old, and cancer stage five is a good example. <clears throat> so the question is, will you live longer with dialysis than without dialysis? And what will the quality of your life be? So this is a complicated question. And it depends again on your kidney number. And if you're stage five, you may be able to delay it just like the patient that James described. Till you get even below five, you can live with below five EGFR. Um, a lot of older folks start dialysis with heart failure, dehydration, some kind of med they're taking like an ACE or an ARB or, or NSAIDs combination of these things can lower your kidney number. <clears throat> and a lot of times you'll be put on dialysis and nobody asks, can my kidneys recover? When you get in a situation where your kidney number dropped a lot, make sure you ask your doc, can we wait till this kidney number gets better? Maybe it will get better. Or are you checking to see if my kidney number got better? Because unfortunately, that's not a routine practice. So if you or one of your family members, and I think this might have happened to James, I think he had AKI, he had his kidney function really crapped out and then got better. And this happens all the time. And don't let somebody put you on dialysis and walk away and never look back to see if your kidneys recover. Way too often that happens. Last thing, James, then I'm going to try to answer as many questions. We got a lot of great questions tonight. Yeah. Uh, what about doing this so-called dialysis access? And look, I'm, I'm going through this really quickly. We will discuss a lot of this, I'm sure, at future Dad Advice TV talks. So not to worry. I'm just trying to give you a broad overview tonight. Uh, to go on hemodialysis, that's the blood type of dialysis. Um, you got to get an access. You got to get a connection in your arm between an artery and a vein. And that's the best thing for young people. If you're going to go on hemodialysis to get that connection between an artery and a vein. If you're an older patient, and if you read my book, I talk about my favorite patient, sweet 90 year old man who came to me because his private, his doctor in the community said, you need to start dialysis. He had four surgeries four surgeries, and he did not need dialysis. So many older folks get these surgeries to prepare them for dialysis, and they never use them. Don't rush. Don't let your doctor rush you into getting one of those things in your arm 
to go on hemodialysis. <clears throat> and, and again, that's another talk, which we can't get into tonight. If you get the chance, do dialysis at home, peritoneal dialysis, much better life than being on hemodialysis. That's my opinion. So we got some time to answer some questions. Oh boy, we got some good ones. Let me let me bring a few of them up. Um, let's see. Uh, someone had asked, is there a certain GFR where you start to see foam in your urine? I get this all the time, Doc. GFR has nothing to do with foam in the urine. Foam in the urine is not a not a important thing. Uh, there is a possibility <clears throat> that if you have a lot of protein in the urine you can start seeing your urine looking foamy on a regular basis, but it's not something to really get excited about. Yeah, and, and to talk a little bit more about the foamy urine, I discovered, Doc, that if you use those bleach tablets that you drop in your tank to help keep your toilet clean, no matter what, your urine will foam. <laughs> the bleach causes the foaming, and a lot of these blue ones now have half bleach, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just increased the amount of emails I get of people's foamy urine saying, is this kidney disease? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. <laughs> um, someone asked, um, when I stand, my chest gets tight. It's hard to breathe. When I lay down, everything feels normal. Is that a symptom of heart failure or kidney disease? To me, that sounds like something to definitely go talk to your doctor about right away. So, so repeat the question, Jay. Uh, when he stands, his chest gets tight and it's hard to breathe. When he lays down, everything feels normal. Yeah, I, I would agree with James. You definitely need to see your cardiologist. It could be a heart problem. It could be heart failure. It could be angina. Let me answer some questions if you don't mind, James. Yep, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. There's lots of them tonight. Uh, Reese, um, lean 120 uh, be your top number of blood pressure. Yeah. So again, yeah, I answer that for her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 120. Um, if you're a younger person, uh, older folks, 130, uh, you, okay. You may have gone through, I, I won't repeat. No, no, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I don't know how far you I got. only answered the simplest ones. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay. James, expand on what you mean about living heart healthy and why it's more important than GFR. James is right on. James, you are my man. Someone asked, how do, I, <laughs> how do I improve my GFR? And I said, don't focus on your GFR. Focus on living heart healthy. Be it, and and I, didn't get to, I didn't get to type enough, but I was going to say, kidney does, think of kidney disease as a risk factor for heart disease. James, this goes across the board. We all just experienced COVID. And we might have heard of public health now that we experienced COVID, this pandemic, because <clears throat> the people in public health are the ones we look to for that. People in public health, they focus on the health of the public. And the health of the public is improved by lifestyle changes, not by dialysis, not by fancy drugs, not by procedures. Lifestyle changes are the most important thing for people to live longer. I like that, James. <laughs> um, uh, okay. By GFR 19, correct 2.7s. Uh, and, and the doctors aren't good at anything other than prescribing medications. Sorry, Janice, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, you know, I, I look, if you have a doctor that's not explaining to you what your kidney numbers mean, what kind of kidney problem you have, what you can do to slow your kidney decline. And definitely GFR 19 is a serious concern. What you can do, I would go ahead and look for some other kidney doctor to help explain <clears throat> what it is that you're dealing with and what's the best way to manage it, okay? Good question. Somebody saying GFR stage two or three, my doctor had multiple blood urine tests done for six months, all came back good. For some reason, the creatinine is 142 and GFR 65, but he stumped. <clears throat> okay, uh, 142 is 1.42, roughly 
EGFR 65. Again, not to worry. It's labeled Frankenstein. I don't know why, but not to worry. <laughs> That's a username on YouTube. <laughs> not to worry, Frankenstein. Again, the labs that I consider sophisticated and doing the right thing are not even reporting numbers over 60. Forget it again, unless you happen to have the protein in the urine. Um, and they don't. <clears throat> yeah, right. Okay. Now, somebody, uh, Kelvin's on dialysis. Um, my PCV was, what's PCV? I'm not sure. I do six not four. know. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what PCV is, but if you're saying that that's the equivalent of your kidney number or your EGFR, okay. Uh, you may have been started early on dialysis. Some of you, and I don't, it's probably not very many of your viewers, may be on dialysis with a kidney number that's over 10, making a lot of urine, okay? you may have started inappropriately early without any good reason to be on it. <clears throat> there is, and I have patients and friends that have done this. There is a possibility of discussing with your doctor. Let's see if we can try off the kidney machine. If you're making enough urine and you could be managed medically, I'm not recommending it, but that is a possibility. Um, we did have a couple that came right after another talking about back pain. Um, can you briefly talk about back pain and kidney disease? Yeah, kidney disease does not give you any symptoms. My best story of that is one of my VA uh, colleagues worked with me in the VA, showed up with a creatinine of 22. 22 creatinine. EGFR. Whoa. Two, didn't know there was a problem. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, you can have advanced kidney disease and not know you have a problem. It won't give you back pain, won't give you any pain. The only people that may have pain is, a, is an unusual class of kidney problem, which is called polycystic kidney disease. And that's where they get these tumors that grow in their kidneys. Get no, they get cysts. They get cysts. Cysts, cysts, yeah. Right. And, and a lot of you may have cysts in your kidneys, which we all can get with age. It's that those are, those are not, uh, those are not tumors. They're cysts. <clears throat> um, okay. Well, we had someone ask, are you familiar with lupus, um, and yeah. how it relates to kidney disease? Can you talk a little oh, bit yeah, about yeah. that? That's something that <laughs> people ask a lot about and I have very little uh, okay. Conversation about Systemic it. Systemic lupus or SLE. SLE is uh, okay. This this could be a, a, another hour's discussion, but is there a specific question about lupus? He says <coughs> um, he's on prednisone and his my Oh, it's another medication to stop his body okay. from attacking. Well, let, let me. This is way too complicated. The only thing I will tell you is that there's a lot of good research on treating patients with kidney disease due to lupus. This is one of the situations where you need to get a biopsy to know what kind of lupus problem you have. And there are lots of good treatments that have been shown to slow progression in lupus. That's all I'm going to say tonight. We got another person whose brother-in-law is diabetic. He's on dialysis, won't control his diabetes, eating a lot of high carbs. Look, <clears throat> I'm not telling you that you should tell your your brother-in-law to eat what he wants, but it's probably when you're on dialysis, uh, a lot of people lose weight, and um, yeah, and getting your sugar under control is not going to obviously have that much benefit if you're already on dialysis. Mm -hmm. So I would say he needs to not get really high on his sugar. And I don't know that, that your, your brother-in-law eating high carb foods is really that much of a thing that you should worry about. I'd be more worried <clears throat> if he was drinking too much fluid. As far as, um, Liz, uh, getting a dietary referral. Listen, I think that it would be nice 
for all of us to get some information about it, about diet options. You don't have to see a dietitian just because you've been told you have CKD. The time that a dietitian becomes really critical is when you get much lower levels of kidney function and you start getting into trouble with things like potassium. Um, but I'm all for everyone getting some advice from a dietitian at some point. <clears throat> um, so uh, somebody had a dad when GFR went to 20, had a UTI, kidney infection, went back to 60. Look, I don't know that it had anything to do <clears throat> with this kidney infection, but I could tell you this. So many people like James, he's a great case in point, have a r really serious decline of their kidney function, their kidney number, and then it gets back to their baseline. Main message, especially older folks, they get on dialysis when their kidney number declines for one of many different reasons. Make sure you ask your kidney doctor, can my kidneys recover and can we wait and see if they will? Um, somebody's talking about sweating. Very, very good question. Alicia, oh, sweating. Sorry. Very, very, very important, especially older folks. And I'll tell you something. See what James just did? James has his water by his side. <clears throat> In general, I don't think we all should be drinking lots of water like James is doing, unless we've got a reason. If you got kidney stones, by all means, drink plenty of water to prevent kidney stones. Here's another one. If you want to lose weight, maybe drinking a lot of water can help with that. All you older folks, because as we get older, some people can't even tell that they're thirsty and they get dehydrated. I would err on the side, unless you got heart failure, of drinking, taking like James does, have a little thing of ice water and drinking some, especially in the heat. Because dehydration is one of the commonest causes of your kidney function going down temporarily. And a lot of people get on a kidney machine when that happens. So yeah, be sure to drink. And all older folks, I would say drinking water is probably a good idea unless you got heart failure. <clears throat> Somebody, Cindy, GFR 44, increased to 65 on a plant-based diet. My doctor never ordered a urinalysis. Absolutely. Cindy, your doctor, and I hate to say this, it is a shame that I can't tell you how often. That's a great question, Cindy. Excellent question. I can't tell you how often I've seen people in consultation with abnormal kidney number, abnormal EGFR, repeated over and over and over again, and no one ever checked their urine protein, which again is more important for most of you than your kidney number. Yes, Cindy, insist that your doctor check your urine protein and get a urinalysis. Now, do you have to have that done by a nephrologist or could that be done by your family doctor? Oh, yeah, no, no, any, any doctor, any doctor, any lab. It's, just, it's, this is like the commonest test that we should all have at some point as a screen and, and anyone with abnormal kidneys must have it and it must be followed just like your EGFR is followed. <clears throat> Here's another one. Lynn Drake, 48. EGFR, went to 43, then to 60, now 53. All of these numbers are probably, this is a great example. These questions are great, Shane. It's showing you that don't get hung up on any one number. And like I say, I've just seen people today in the clinic where their numbers bounce around. I look at the trend over months to years. And I look at, is there something I can do over the long term to slow kidney decline? Or is there something that's causing the short-term drop, like dehydration, or like taking an ACE or an ARB or an NSAID? Great question. Um, and someone had asked a weightlifting question. I wanted to make sure you saw. Um, they said, is weightlifting safe for stage two? First of all, forget stage two. We are talking about anything, stage two, anything below anything above 60 is is either stage one or two unless you've got protein in your urine not to worry stage over 60 
without protein in the urine, not kidney disease as far as I'm concerned, okay? Especially an older person, absolutely not. But, you know, weightlifting is fine. Uh, it is possible for weightlifters to mess their muscles up and cause kidney failure, but that's extremely rare. And you have to do a lot of uh, heavy lifting. <clears throat> Somebody talks to Kelly about alcohol free and kidneys. Uh, alcohol drinking booze does not have anything to do with kidney failure. Uh, this is a person, Kelly, who slowed the microalbumin to 30 was 68. These numbers, okay, microalbumin is less than 300. If you're over 300, then talk to me. All these numbers, these microalbumins of 68, under 30, 70, just like the EGFRs in the 60 range, they're not really meaningful. They don't have any real meaning. If you are consistently running two plus protein or consistently running a number around 300 to 300, then you've got a problem. So alcohol didn't affect it. And for most people, when you have that real low level of protein, it's not real serious protein in the urine. <clears throat> um, somebody has a son with stage five or ongoing peritoneal dial. Stem therapy, I really am not familiar with. But here's the thing about young people and kidney disease. By all means, prepare to get a kidney transplant. The best way to deal with end stage, and again, no rushing to get a kidney transplant. That's, that's why there's just like there's no rush to get dialysis. If you've got a kidney number between five and 10, and you need to either go on to dialysis or to transplant, by all means, a transplant is a almost normal life. So try to organize kidney donors. If you've got a young person with kidney disease, try to organize uh, potential donors. And um, I guess we're getting close, James, huh? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get one more in. Okay. Uh, Who's the lucky person? Can you take diuretics if they're prescribed? Heard bad for kidneys, along with low sartan. Okay, the profit. So what about diuretics and low sartan? So here's the thing. Low sartan is an ARB. It's, remember we said if you got protein in the urine, you should be on an ACE or an ARB. OK, <clears throat> the best way to get those drugs to be effective for your blood pressure or any blood pressure drug is to combine it with a diuretic. So the diuretic in itself is not bad for your kidneys. The low sartan is not bad for the kidneys, but you can get a decline of kidney function by being on one of these acerobs like low sartan like the captopril and allopril, and uh, those are those are the, the pril drugs are the ACEs. They can give you a short-term decrease in your kidney function, but over years it will slow kidney the progression to kidney failure. So not to worry in general, but you need to have your kidney function monitored. And I think that, right. that wraps and that us brings up. us to the top of the hour. And I want to I'm going to mention your book one more time. As you guys saw, Dr. Rowe makes it easy to understand kidney disease and far less confusing than what you're probably hearing from your current doctor and definitely what you're reading out on the internet. If you don't have a copy of his book, you can get a copy of it from Amazon or any bookstore. They can order a copy of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease or you can go to the link go.dadvicetv.com slash book and that will take you to it on Amazon so you can pick up your own copy. And Doc, it was fantastic having you back. Woohoo! You know, all excited to be set up at the new location. Um, I can't remember when the next show is. Are we doing another one this month or is it I'm next month? Try. I have, I've got my, uh, my oldest child with her three kids coming for a visit in a couple weeks. But I'm planning on doing it, and I will let you know when awesome, I get it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. All right, well, everybody, thank you so much. Please give the video a thumbs up. That helps with the, the way YouTube recommends videos and shows them to other people searching mm -hmm. about kidney disease. Let's get this great, helpful, fact-based information 
above all the fake scams or just trying to empty your wallet and sell you what Dr. Rowe and I like to call the woo-woo. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, everybody. This is my last video for this week, but I will be right back next week with Shelby from Plant Powered Kidneys talking about more healthy diet stuff. All right. Bye, everyone. And I'll see you in the next video.